Right now she's going to um, do a PowerPoint presentation for us. Let's welcome Professor Dolores Cahill all the way from Miami. <laughs> So thank you. Now, I am going to talk about the law today. And of course, as you know, I am an immunologist, so uh, uh, this is not legal advice. A um, little bit daunting to be talking in a law session with Ryan or so many people, but uh, I shall do my best. So today is just talking about the difference between the law versus the legal system. And the reason why I am just Framing it this way is, I think, this is a, a proposal to solve what's going on. It's just a proposal, uh, and I welcome you feedback if uh, this is incorrect. So I just want to say this is a photograph, non-doctored, of the farm that I grew up in in Tipperary, and it's beautiful. And that is the little castle that we overlooked, and I went to school in Tikash on the brow of the hill. Uh, and my ancestors have come from Tipperary for a time in the morning. So I mention that because what you may not be aware of is that there was a precedence case in the whole world against one farmer, John Hanahan, versus the pharmaceutical industry, Mark Sharpendon. And this case, we experienced this case, you may have heard me talking about it in our interviews, more or less when I was a child, around seven years old, for all of my teenagers, and it essentially um, destroyed a, a fabulous valley, both its environment and its health. And when the factory started emitting from an incinerator, 17 of our cows were born dead, some with two heads, some with two front quarters, having never lost a calf in our farm or any of our neighbours. What was very revealing though was that this divided the community. And the arguments were what we see today between jobs and progress. And the health consequences were entirely ignored. So as a child, I literally saw playing out in front of my eyes what is going on now. We had politicians coming saying there's nothing to see here. We had councillors testing the water, and obviously it was something in the air. So essentially what's now called gaslighting was happening in real time. So it's very interesting. And because of the financial ruin on ourselves and the health ruin, at 15 years old, I wanted to go to university. So I went on my own, travelling to Europe, found a job in Bavaria, working and picking rotten gherkins out of a gherkin factory for four summers in order to fund my family. But during that time, I was aware of the psychological aspect of what was the division that was going on in my beautiful homeland. So I went to East Germany and I went to Dachau and studied the concentration camps and the psychology behind dividing people and understanding what was going on because it was exactly a foretaste of what's happening now. So if you keep that in mind, I won't go into that what's going on now is laid out in documents. It was in a book in 1971, none dare call it a conspiracy, if any of you has read that. It sold five million, few, a million copies in the first year. And there was a book in 1992 called The Committee of 300 that essentially is going behind exactly the agenda that is being planned now. And when I decided to do my career to try and uncover this, knowing what was happening now, they were retelling then the killing years would be between 2020 and the end of 2025. That when I really saw what was, I actually couldn't speak in the 90s for two or three weeks. I mean, I was functional, but I was in such shock at the detail of what was proposed. So for example, 30 years ago, they said, which was 30 years in the future, in 2015, across the world, the police will use their alarm signals to raise the general anxiety of the population. They would dim our street lights so that people would be fearful and they would stay at home. And there was going to be a series of pandemics. So I basically 
you know, chose my career. I could have studied the law, but I decided to go into science and, as you know, taken one year at a time in order to prepare for what's happening now. So I invented a technology, high content protein arrays. It was patented worldwide. And I became an expert in patenting law, and we were granted this. And this was basically to say you could put a recombinant anything on anything and use it for any application, including diagnostic application. But the fundamental application was that you could test antibodies that are used in diagnostic tests and show whether they were accurate or not, and not one of them were ever accurate, and we essentially brought down the whole diagnostic industry because they were using false tools in false tests, falsely declaring that people had diseases that they didn't have in order to give them treatments that would make them more safe, including in the pathology industry. So I'll just so this is just to say this is more or less what I spent my career on, and then in 2018, I was advocating, it was obvious, as you may know, I, I very early in my 20s, I was asked by the German government, the Irish government, the European Union, and the United States to advise them on how do you solve problems in countries, including in innovation and jobs, and it's really easy. So it was, I tried to retire in 2016, my university wouldn't administer my pension because they knew what I was going to do. And it was to use my technology to profile adverse events in order to get justice for people. And I met Doug Guthrie, you know, in 2015, because I went around the world, having done this essentially privately, but it was now the time to actually use this technology to prepare for what's coming now. So very quickly, the reason why adverse events is related to the law, because this is the area of, the law is inalienable rights. So this little slide on the left-hand side is the law on the left-hand side. So people, there is a psychological operation, people say, oh, I don't understand the law, it's complicated. This is the law. You act in honor, you do no harm, and you have, and they can never be taken away, inalienable rights of freedom of speech, freedom of travel, but of course, essentially, the right to life, and the right to bodily integrity, the right to free speech, and that free speech is also you require the, the right to travel and the right to assemble to meet people in order to speak. And what is being attacked now with PCR testing and injections is these inalienable rights because they want to make multiple generations think that we don't get our rights. So the language is important. We don't reclaim our rights. We have these inalienable rights. And any member of parliament or any judge or anyone dressed up as a judge or a policeman, they are committing a crime if they put any act through any parliament that infringes on your inalienable rights. And that crime is called malfeasance and it's 10 years in prison. So it's very simple. And as you know, in War Freedom Alliance, we've sent out 40,000 notices of liability, including to all of the heads of our nations and the so-called heads of state. And under the law, if you put notice to principal as notice to agent, once you notify one man or woman, they have a duty under the law to notify everybody else. And people are always asking, does this work? Cancer was not notified cigarette smoking, but asbestos was. And asbestos was withdrawn because individual men and women are liable under the law for the harm they do. In this case, somebody injecting into someone's arm is liable under the law. There is no immunity. So people are saying, okay, where does this fit in? And I just want to go back to Ireland again, because Ireland has had for tens of thousands of years an amazingly sophisticated system of law called Brehan Law. And Brehan Law meant we had no police and we had no prisons in the nation for tens of thousands of years because you are innocent until proven guilty. The real jury is a jury of your peers under Brown law, right under the law. And then because you are speaking to people's consciousness, right, conscience about right and wrong, there is no judge in the law. You are tried by your peers. So this is very important because we have that for tens of thousands of years. Now, I'm only mentioning this because, we say, Colin Kill lived 1,500 years ago, 
and that Ireland, through its saints and scholars, brought back knowledge about the law 1,500 years ago, after the fall of the Roman Empire. But what we've seen in Ireland playing out in the last 100 years, or 200 years, is the switch between the law and the legal system, which I'm going to explain, but I just wanted to put it into context. Can I keep the slides up? Because there's... Um, great. So, the legal system is where they come in and they say that you are dead. I'm just at one slide to explain how that happens. And then they say, you don't have any rights unless we give them to you. So they codify the rights. They say it's in the Declaration of Human Rights or the EU Human Rights, Color of Man, and then they take them away. So what I say is they give them in one generation. Oh, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Color of Rights, and, and then we take them away. So I just want to say, people go, where does this legal system come from, right? Now, of course, we all admire lawyers, and I can honestly say many of the lawyers don't really know this. Where did the legal system come from? The legal system is not the same as the law. So the legal system was basically is a combination between the three, three or four cities, as we know, the city of London, the city of Rome, uh, the Vatican, so-called black nobility, black because what they were doing was essentially evil, and Washington. And I just wanted to put it up here that these are basically the various trusts that the Roman Catholic Church constituted in collaboration with the kings of England. And what they did was more or less say that they were going to steal all of the living people steal their souls and turn them into something that was not alive. Now, why this is very important in the vaccine adverse event issue is that if you are seen as not alive, you cannot be harmed. And so I think what people should be asking is, why is there 3.8 million people harmed on these clinical trials? and they're not stopped. And this is the reason why they're not stopped. And so partly, if we don't understand the problem, the issue, we can't identify the solution. So essentially, if you look at it, they declared in 16, so after the Great Fire of London in 1666, that everyone was dead. And unless you reclaimed your life you would always be seen as dead in the legal system. Okay? So this is very simple, right? The law applies to men and women. I just have a few more slides. Sorry, men and women, boys and girls, people. Right? Legalese is the language, so it's a separate language. So how people don't know that they are being referred to as something that's dead. The other words that the legal system uses for people is imbecile. The reason why they are representing you is that you are deaf and dumb to the court. You are essentially a ward of court because you are sadly so stupid you don't know who you are. And that's why you are represented. You are summoned to court. You are summoned from the dead. But you cannot be harmed, you cannot suffer adverse events, you cannot be put on trial, you, you know, if your mother is killed in the legal system. And in the law, you are innocent until proven guilty. But you know, so what I'm saying now is if you want to see fraud and malfeasance being committed, because no one is above the law, including the judges, you listen to what does the man dressed up as a judge say. If he says, are you guilty? or not guilty, he's committing a crime of fraudulent misrepresentation of the law, which is up to 10 years in prison. So this is then practically, how do you know you are not alive in their system? You will get something that's in capital letters. It has to be in black, because black is for blood that is that has died. Your blood is black. If you are living, you have red blood because you're alive. 
So you are summoned from the dead. So this is really significant if we want to get justice for people who have adverse events. So, so how do they do it then, right? This is very important. What they've done, you saw, in the legal system is set up everything as a trust. And it turns out, a summons is a trust, your mortgage is a trust, your credit card is a trust, your passport is a trust, your birth cert, most importantly, is a trust. And that's why they are saying you are lost at sea, but the sea is the sea of the Vatican. And that's why it's a birth canal, that's why your waters are broken. And what they do and why they change the practices of birthing, and this is a birthing certificate, like a ship, and that's why it is related, it's also a financial instrument, and that's why the financial instrument that is really backed by our souls is in banks and its currency because it's all related. So what they've done is removed us from the earth and that our genius and our intellect are wrapped up in their financial instruments and trust. So this is, I just looked at my trust up yesterday for one of my, for my birth cert. Just to prove to you it's a financial instrument. Oh no, actually that's one of the court cases that I have for exercising our inalienable rights. I just thought I'd have a look up. So the court cases are, are trusts and that's how you deal with them. And it has 1,730 transactions in 15 months. So I looked up my birth cert and it has 127,000 financial transactions. And all of you here. Okay, so I'm just done. The last few slides is then how does this work? That what we have is the natural law which have our inalienable rights. And as we saw with Willem Engel, because I interviewed Willem Engel, he's one of the leaders in the world in this, on my radio show. But in, he was arrested two times. But we had, he had an amazing discussion about inalienable rights. The second time they arrested him going to an interview for what he may say in the future. And 10,000 people wrote envelopes to the prison. Because he has been talking about inalienable rights. And when he came in front of the judge, of course, the judges, and no one is above the law. And any judge in entertaining, imprisoning someone for freedom of speech, freedom of travel, the judge is on trial. And of course the judge says, you have inalienable rights that can never be taken away and you can never give up and release them and say, we cannot have this. Okay? So what they do is, in the, just the last few slides, they do what's called, we're calling a switcheroo. <coughs> And what they do is, they essentially, for maybe six generations, are educating so-called people in the legal system as if it's inverted. So they call it a court because it's a game. They call it an act because they're acting. It's an emperor has no clothes. Okay, and then, so I'm just saying this is how you get through it. Okay, so, so partly as well, you know, in a republic, if one person is harmed, you protect one person, that's under the law. What they have done is switched it, inverted it, as if everything is just, it's for the common good of everybody, so that you have to have your inalienable rights infringed for everybody else. But actually under the law, it's exactly the other way around. And I just wanted to um, just talk about, I have this radio show, but I want to say that I was really struck by what Del Victory was saying yesterday, which resonated very much with me, that it doesn't mean that everybody has to do all this. We just need one or two people, like Del is doing, really teaching the world about adverse events, and then just support the people that are actually trying to get the message out and the big reveal. And I just wanted to thank um, Mohammed Bhatt, who's here for brand new tune, because it's amazing. Uh, because, you know, if we can get the message out that actually this is how you, I think that's my last slide actually, that, that is the last slide. So these are just some of the initiatives, but you may know that there was a warrant that I was very honored to be involved, uh, as many are here, as Zach is here in. Uh, Sophie um, and Margarita from the Trafalgar Square Initiative. But I actually paid for 
you know, as we all did, uh, the screens, partly, there was about 10 of us, because I was exercising my inalienable rights of freedom of speech and freedom of travel, and I went through the airport. So now there are seven or eight court cases in Ireland, and allegedly a warrant out for my arrest, around freedom of speech, right, freedom of travel. But of course, what I've been doing, because this case is a trust, I've been in the process of saying to the system, produce the summons and produce the warrant because they need to sign it or autograph it. And if whoever does that, they carry all of the liability that if it is not a criminal offence, these are being in the criminal courts to exercise your freedom of travel, to speak in Ireland and speak in London, then the spotlight turns back at the Director of Public Prosecutions, the person dressed up as a guard, the person dressed up as a judge. Professor Dolores Kale from Ireland and um, 